I don't even know where to tell you to turn. Just find one of those minor prophets and turn there, and uh, whichever one you like the best. We are concluding our series. We started back in January. This is uh, we spent 34 weeks in the minor prophets, which has been quite a journey. I'm hoping you learned some things because I'm going to give you a chance to share maybe some things that uh, stood out to you as we've gone through this the past 34 weeks. So it's a little different kind of service, um, but it's a great way to sort of conclude everything. I believe my responsibility as a shepherd is to preach the whole counsel of God, which means to the best of my abilities, I want to present God's word uh, as accurately as I possibly can. And I also want to go through all of God's word as much as I possibly can. And that means jumping around and getting, making sure that we are covering all the different uh, aspects of God's word. The minor prophets are oftentimes neglected, but they speak very relevantly to our world today. In fact, this is probably the very message we need to hear today. Um, just to give you a little bit of an idea, let's see, do I have slides yet? No, I don't. Boy. Okay, I don't have slides either. There we go. Thank you. I would be in bad shape if I don't have my slides. I need my slides. Um, good reminder, just uh, again, when were they prophesied? Let me go back one. Uh, the Hebrew scriptures divided up into the law, the prophets, and the writing. is called the Tanakh. Uh, the minor prophets would be here among the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve. Minor prophets were on one scroll. They were considered a unified group of prophets. Yes, different messages, but a unified message, just like the Bible, 66 books, but a unified message. The prophets speak a message that is to be unified and is to be seen as a unified message. Uh, again, the time period Israel has divided as a nation. Um, this was after Solomon died, Rehoboam and Jeroboam divided the kingdom. So the Davidic uh, hope of a Davidic king over a unified Israel was lost in 931 B.C., and will not be regained until Jesus Christ uh, reigns again on this earth. And so the prophets are looking forward to that time. They're looking forward with hope to the coming of Messiah and to the establishment of his kingdom. Again, it's a time period that's a lot of turmoil, uncertainty, fear, discouragement, false hopes. Uh, it's a time of empires. The Assyrian Empire has dominated the world from 900 to 612 B.C., and they were an empire of terrorism, an empire that said, submit or we will torture you, is basically how they conquered the world. Then Babylon arrived on the scene, 612 to 539. They conquered the world more through indoctrination. They took the best and the brightest from all these nations and educate them as Babylonians. And once you educate the young people as Babylonians, then the hope is the Babylon Empire will last forever. Now, it almost sounds familiar. But anyway, uh, and then the next empire was the Persian Empire which was an empire of tolerance. They basically said, worship whoever you want, just don't cause any problems to the empire. And they ruled from 539 to 331 B.C. Key thing to realize is everything's been centered in the Middle East from the beginning of time. And that's where Scripture says that's where we're going to be centered at the end of time as well. Uh, Babylon is modern-day Iraq. Persia is modern-day Iran. And, of course, Assyria would be modern-day Syria and the area where ISIS is controlling even uh, today. So the minor prophets are speaking into this age. There's 12 of them. I'm going to summarize their, well, before I go into summarizing the 12 books, again, remember there's 12 of them. If you're like me, when you, when you try to memorize the books of the Bible and you got to the minor prophets, ah, so hopeless. I had no idea how to keep these things in order. More than trying to keep them in order, I want you to see the flow of their thought. The first five are called the Pentateuch of the minor prophets. And if you see, they are bracketed by God's relentless love. Uh, God's love for Israel, that love is a holy love. Uh, sin is what's destroying our world, and so his love does not mean it's this, uh, this weak, syrupy kind of love. It's a love that is passionate for our holiness because holiness is the beauty of holiness. Sin is what destroys that. So God's love for Israel, then his judgment in Joel and Amos and Obadiah on Israel and the nations, and then Jonah reminding of his love for the nations. The next four prepare us for the Messiah and his kingdom. His kingdom is coming. Know that he's going to bring justice and trust him no matter what and seek him before the day of the Lord. And I think the last three were the last three on the scene to prepare Israel for their Messiah. What is your priority? Will you return to me? And where is your heart? Let me quickly run through all 12 of them in uh, 12 seconds and see if we can then give you some time to share some things you may have learned. Man, we began with Hosea, the opening one of the minor prophets, reminding us that God's love for his people is like the husband-wife relationship. 
And Hosea becomes a picture of God's love as he marries a woman who is constantly uh, given to adultery and is constantly leaving him for other lovers. And Hosea's heart for his wife is a picture of God's heart for his people. Uh, We are constantly running after other idols and running after other gods. And God is pouring out his love towards us. And he says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? My heart churns within me. All my compassion is aroused. And you see a picture of the heart of God as he is passionate for us and he loves us. And his love is what compels him to seek our holiness. Uh, Then Joel, remember the locusts, and he talks about a locust plague that devastated the land. He says that's nothing compared to a devastation that's going to come with a northern army that's going to invade the land. And uh, in that time, only God's deliverance is going to be the hope that the people have. So he says, alas, for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. Amos, a similar message. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? Their book begins with this. A lion has roared from Zion. God is sovereign. He is the creator. He's a sustainer. He holds your life in his hand. And he has roared. Uh, How can you not listen? to the sovereign God of the universe, and he has roared out against the sin of his people, and he's calling them to repentance, again, out of his love, but also out of his passionate uh, judgment and holiness. And then we go into Obadiah, which reminds us that, yes, God is going to judge his people, but he's also going to judge the nations. And Obadiah is written to Edom, a brother nation to Israel, but they did not treat them like brothers. In fact, uh, they mistreated them. And they lived in Petra. If you've ever seen Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, that city of Petra, was considered an unconquerable city because to get to it, you had to go through this narrow passageway about as wide as this aisle. And the thought was you could defend that city against anybody because they have to come through almost single file. And Obadiah says, the pride of your hearts deceived you, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock. You're not secure. You think you are, but you're not. For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. And all the nations that think they're secure, all the people that think they're secure, don't understand the security only comes from God himself. Jonah, we followed that disobedient prophet through those stages of life. Uh, Jonah is a prophet, and yet how many words does he speak in prophecy? Repent. In 40 days, God's going to overthrow Nineveh. That's the entire prophecy. His life itself is the prophecy, a reminder of our disobedience. We hear God's word, and we want to go the other direction. Uh, The reminder of salvation, I think Jonah died in that big fish. I don't think he was there um, writing letters while he was inside the whale's belly or the fish's belly. I think he actually died, and his picture is, his salvation is a picture of resurrection. Obedience as he goes and obeys, but then his heart is still not right, and then God teaching him compassion in chapter 4, the heart of God. Uh, So often we as believers can obey, we can go through the motions, but we don't resonate with the heart of God. And we almost want people to be judged. And we talk about them and how bad they are. And our heart is not burdened and concerned for their salvation, even though God's called us to be ministers of reconciliation and not condemnation. Grace is stamped over all of Jonah's life as it is stamped on ours. And if you understand that grace, it will motivate you to show grace to others. Micah reminds us of our longing for a kingdom. Uh, and the longing for kingdom is not going to become because of governments and because of the United Nations. It ultimately comes when the Prince of Peace reigns, and it looks forward to the kingdom and to the king. Nahum reminds us that God is going to bring judgment on the nations. Uh, that's a picture of Nineveh, the ancient city of Nineveh, which was also considered unconquerable. You learn through this, don't ever think you're unconquerable, <laughs> or don't think your ship is unsinkable. It just doesn't do well uh, in God's eyes, and Uh, Nineveh thought they were unconquerable as a city, and God said, uh, in fact, they had these curse treaties where they proclaimed how great they were and how anyone that disobeyed them would be uh, destroyed. And God takes their very curse treaty and writes the book of Nahum, the most poetic book in the Old Testament, and it's a poetic justice on the people who refuse to acknowledge God. God is jealous, and he avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and reserves wrath for his enemies. Nineveh was so thoroughly destroyed that it was buried under a heap of rubble and was not discovered until 1850 A.D., destroyed in 612 B.C. Many people thought the Bible was uh, wrong because they think the city probably didn't even exist. And then some guy had enough faith, Henry Lanyard, to go and dig in a hill called the Hill of Jonah, (laughs) who had also gone to Nineveh. 
and he found the ancient city of Nineveh and incredible uh, writings that were in that uh, find. That's modern-day Mosul, by the way, where ISIS is destroying many of these uh, artifacts from Nineveh. Then we go to Habakkuk, which reminds us in the midst of everything going on crazy in the world, God sends this. Uh, remember, Habakkuk is struggling. God, our, our nation is filled with violence. It's filled with lying and deception. Why don't you do something? And God says, I am doing something. I'm raising up the Babylonians to come and destroy your nation. And Habakkuk's saying, that's not the answer I wanted, God. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. And God says, behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just will live by his faith. He says, you need to put this on tablets, just like the Ten Commandments, and that message needs to be spread throughout the world. The proud, his soul's not right within him, but the just live by faith. A reminder that there's only two types of people in the world, those that rely on themselves and their self-righteousness, their soul's not right before a holy and righteous God, their life is never satisfied, and the justified or the righteous who rely on God, their soul is made right by faith, and life is a gift. What did you do to earn physical life? Nothing. It was a gift offered to you, a gift given to you. All you can do is receive it and be thankful for the gift that it is. What do you do to earn spiritual life? Absolutely nothing. It's a gift offered to you. All you can do is receive it and be thankful to the one who gave it to you. And that's what it means to live by faith. Recognize I have nothing. I'm bankrupt before a holy and righteous God. I need his salvation and only his salvation, which comes through Christ. Zephaniah reminds us of the day of the Lord. He talks about the day of the Lord. We live in the day of man, but the day of the Lord is coming. Uh, we live in a story. Just about every movie or story you like has rising conflict leading up to a climax. And a good story builds that tension as you watch the antagonist and the protagonist, and they, they fight. It almost seems like the protagonist isn't going to win. And then the climax happens, and he carries the day. And those kind of movies thrill our soul because we live in that kind of story and when Christ comes back that will be the beginning of the well the day of the Lord begins with darkness and that's the dawning of the day of the Lord when Messiah reigns then we went to Haggai reminder that our priorities get messed up and they were focused on their own homes instead of focusing on the temple of God and God's reminding them to consider their ways because God's temple is what he is going to ultimately glorify and then Zechariah which I was only going to spend one week on because I read it and I had no clue what it was talking about. <laughs> and we ended up spending six weeks in it because it's probably my favorite one now. And I love vision four that he has where he's standing before a holy, well, the angel of the Lord, and he's in filthy rags. And the serpent, the Satan, is accusing him, saying he doesn't belong here, God. He is in filthy rags. You need to get him out of your presence and yet the angel of the Lord says, I have removed his iniquity. And he takes off those filthy rags, puts them in rich robes, and he stands before him in righteousness. And I love this picture because back here you see his filthy rags and you see his arm that has been pierced as he's bore our sin and cleansed us. And then at the end of Zechariah, it says Israel one day is going to look up for salvation and they're going to see the one whom they have pierced returning. And when Israel ex receives their Messiah, that's when the redemption of the world takes place. And then we see Malachi, where is my honor? Where is my reverence? For I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts. My name is to be feared among the nations. And Malachi is reminding us the people are challenging God. We don't know if you love us. We don't know how we're bothering you. you it's a weariness to serve you. And he says, you don't know, have any clue who I am. I, where's my honor? Where's my reverence? I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts. My name is to be feared among the the nations. And again, I think there's a flow there, uh, beginning with the passionate love of God, ending with a question of where is your heart, showing us God's love balanced by his holy wrath and judgment, which ultimately points to the Messiah who's going to bear his wrath so he can show us his love. What did you learn? 34 weeks. Hopefully you maybe picked up something along the way. Just give you an opportunity to share um, encourage one another. Maybe something God reminds you of or taught you. Oh, don't discourage me. <laughs> no, thank you. You may want to stand up and talk that way. I don't know if they can hear you. You don't want to.
Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, it's a minority view, and I did clarify that. But I don't think Jonah was swallowed and sat around for three days figuring out how am I going to get out of this gastric stomach, you know. Uh, the, the language there, it's either poetic, acting like he died, or it's literal poetry. He did die. I think he died, and he was resurrected. That's why Jesus said the only sign you'll get is the sign of Jonah. Jonah himself is the sign of the resurrection, and uh, Jesus is a resurrected Savior. And so that's why that's such a powerful sign. Yes, Helen. Yeah, that's a declaration of faith that is easy to write, very hard to live. And um, thank you for taking that challenge and writing it. Yeah, you'd have no idea. Um, and yet God is faithful. He gave you the feet of a deer to get through it. And he's getting you through it. Yeah. Like I said, we don't often pray for deer's feet. Don't, have you ever prayed that? <laughs> Lord, give me deer's feet. And that's where it's good not to take things too literally because that would be a little weird if you woke up with deer's feet. But if you remember those, those pictures we showed of those ibex climbing these mountains that just would scare us to death to even being close to the edge, and yet God has given them the exact kind of foot to grip. They have, they have gripping pads within the hooves that enables the hooves to spread and grip. Like It's incredible how God designed them specifically to cross those hills, and God gives us the same ability. Amen. Thank you for sharing that, Helen. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes. And it was a reminder, uh, Jonah was more concerned about that little vine that gave him comfort than he was about the whole city of Nineveh. And the question God would ask us is, are you more concerned about your personal comforts than you are about the destiny of thousands of people who do not know me? That's a... That's not a children's story. <laughs> That's a story that hits us right where we are. Yes. Yeah. Well, I probably should have had a microphone. Yeah, he, he just summarized the whole book of Jonah for us. <laughs> um, if you, can you go back there and sit next to her and just show her? 
He did a good job. Yeah, I have a microphone, but I can't feel it because it's small. That's true. Yes. Oh, Bob and then Janine. Yeah. And that's God's love for us. Amen. Yeah, picture of, yep. Amen. And it's, it's awesome to me that God begins books that when we read the Minor Prophets, we see judgment, 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 and it can be a little overwhelming and very heavy. But he begins with Hosea to say, I have a passionate love for you. And you don't see how much sin is eating you alive. It's almost like a parent watching a son or a child who has an addiction. And you do a severe mercy to them and they don't understand. They think you're not being, you're not being helpful. But you're watching this addiction destroy them and eat them alive. And you're trying your best as a parent to intervene and wake them up. And that's exactly the heart of God. We... We diminish God's holiness, and we diminish the impact of sin. And that's our biggest problem. We diminish God for who he is, and we don't think sin's that big of a deal. And sin always leads to bondage and ultimately to death. Don't kid yourself. If you're being deceived, if you're being drawn away, don't deceive yourselves. Um, God tells us his passionate love so we'll understand the beauty of holiness. He doesn't tell us his commands because he wants to make us miserable. He tells us a command because he's trying to save us from the destruction of our own choices. Um, Janine, you had your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The f- Amen. Thank you. You've gotten a lot out of this. <laughs> Amen. Put them on front row. That's the place to be <laughs> right here. Yes.
Amen. Yeah, when we reject God, we will erect another God in its place. And um, we have erected the God of sex, sex really, um, as our God in this nation. And unfortunately, the church has been impacted. And um, until we get our house in order, uh, we shouldn't be throwing stones at anyone else. And so good, thank you, good reminder. And again, reminder as a body of believers, we need to pray for the families here, the marriages here. There's the church is hemorrhaging. I, I see it. Um, I hear it. And uh, it is breaks my heart because we are to be, the marriage is to be the Christ church illustration to the world. And um, we need to honor that and take it seriously. Before we move into communion, because I want to make sure we have some time, I want to just give a few more summary thoughts. The minor prophets remind us of the character of God. This is going to be a, a picture of God's character that's going to be brought up several times in Nahum and Jonah and Joel. That the Lord, the Lord God, is merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. We love that part. But then he says, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. I want you to understand that the uh, character of God revealed in Exodus 34 creates a dilemma. How can God both forgive iniquity and transgression and sin and at the same time not clear the guilty? How can he do both? How can he forgive sin and at the same time punish sin? It makes no sense. It's a tension that the prophets are feeling. Wait a second. God is going to judge sin, but he keeps talking about his graciousness and his forgiveness. And who's a pardoning God like you at the end of Micah? This word forgiving is an interesting Hebrew word. It's not the normal one. It's the Hebrew word Messiah, which means to bear up. The way that he can both forgive iniquity and judge iniquity at the same time is by bearing it up himself. The character of God in Exodus 34 is pointing us to our desperate need for the Lamb of God, someone who bears God's wrath in order to extend his grace. And so that's why the minor prophets are constantly pointing to this Messiah who's going to come, who's going to be both a priest and a king. Um, we need an anointed one, a prophet who speaks the truth to us. You need someone to speak the truth to you. Scripture's not going to flatter you. <laughs> it's going to speak the truth about the condition of your heart. Then you need a priest, someone who represents you before a holy God and is willing to offer a sacrifice, even himself, as a sacrifice to reconcile you with a holy God. And then you need a king, someone who can uh, conquer uh, the sin in your life and conquer death and conquer Satan and redeem this earth. You need someone to speak the truth, to bear your sin, and who can redeem you and this earth. And that's why you look for a Messiah. And we can see all through the old minor prophets, he's the Davidic king, the resurrected one, one born in Bethlehem, though he's eternal, he's anointed one, he's God in our midst, uh, Emmanuel, the sin cleanser, the lowly king, the rejected shepherd, the pierced one, and the messenger of the covenant. And then our call to faith, which Helen, you good reminder, is to trust him, to put our faith in him, and to rejoice in the God of our salvation, regardless of what happens in this world. And then this prophetic telescoping as they're seeing, and I put that in your outline again, just a reminder that they're seeing the mountaintops of history. And so oftentimes it's hard to understand the prophets because it seems like they're jumping around all over the place. And sometimes they're jumping from things that are a thousand years apart. And what they're doing is they're seeing the mountain peaks. and They don't quite understand all the valleys uh, in the middle. And I would argue that when you summarize your life, you pick the mountain peaks. And oftentimes you may skip many years but that's exactly what Scripture's doing. Let me just sum up the entire history of the world in uh, one minute. God who says of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever is the one who created the heavens and the earth. He is our creator and designer. He gave us, even though we're made lower than the angels, he gave us an incredible task as man and woman to rule over the earth. Adam and Eve were to rule over the earth. They were to be God's representatives a righteous man and a righteous woman ruling over a righteous earth. That was God's original plan. Sin destroyed that plan and the earth became cursed. We inherited the sin of Adam in our hearts. God began his redemptive plan through the nation of Israel and his promise in the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, that in Abraham and his seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed, reminding us that there's going to be a coming child, a coming Messiah 
He's going to redeem the earth. When Messiah came in the fullness of time, God sent his son. Unfortunately, he was rejected. Well, actually, fortunately, he was rejected. It was God's plan. Uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And thus began the church age as we are to proclaim uh, the mystery uh, of the message of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ, the church being a mystery that not seen in the Old Testament. There's going to be a gap of time, and I believe that hardening in part has happened to the nation of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. I think there's going to be a false Messiah that's going to uh, present himself as a person of peace. Um, Zechariah 11 says they've rejected their shepherd, and they're going to go after a foolish shepherd, and I think that's going to happen. And then um, God's going to work again through the nation of Israel. He's not finished with Israel. He's going to work through them again. That's why I think the church is raptured and God works through the nation of Israel. And then Christ is going to come back. He's going to return. And Christ, the God-man, will rule over the earth. He is the last Adam. He's the one that redeems what was lost in Adam. And who is his righteous bride? The church. Amen. And so, and then God's plan in Genesis, what was lost in Genesis 3 is regained, Revelation 20 through 22. And then there's a new heavens and new earth. And then we have this promise that then comes the end when Christ delivers the kingdom to God, the Father. And so God is a redemptive God. You live in a redemptive story. We are privileged. We're not bringing Christ into our story. We are privileged to be put in his story. And that's a big difference. And therefore, with that, we have hope. We have confidence, we can have joy, and we have a task to be ministers of reconciliation, imploring people to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. If you hear and you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we're going to remember what Christ did, looking back to his death, looking forward to his return. And if you don't know Christ as Savior, I implore you to trust in him. You have no other hope for salvation, for sin and death, than the Messiah, the blood of the Lamb. And I encourage you to trust in Jesus Christ and what he's did for you on the cross and in his resurrection. If you know him, I invite you to partake. And if you don't know him, I encourage you to trust in him or to pass the element since it is a family meal. I'm going to ask my ushers to come forward. And we're going to, as the elements are passed, just again reflect and rejoice that your robes, filthy rags, have been taken away and you've been given the righteous robes of righteousness if you know Jesus Christ. Let's say, 